Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. Okay, preachers, the text for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 28, 2022, are from Proverbs chapter 25, verses 6 and 7. The alternate first reading is Jeremiah 2, 4 through 13. Psalm 112, our last reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, 1 through 8, 15 through 16. And now for the gospel, we find ourselves in chapter 14 of Luke, verses 1 and then 7 to 14. Who are you going to have dinner with? And where will you sit? And where are you going to sit? Will you get there early and like look at the place cards, place card holdings, like when you go to a wedding and you're like, I don't want to sit next to that person. So like if nobody's looking, you like switch them around. I maybe or maybe haven't done that before. I don't know. You sound like you've got experience. <laughs> no one. I know no one. I don't think ever- I've ever done that before because it would just, I, yeah, but not that I haven't <laughs> thought about it. How about that? <sighs> yeah, the trick here, I think, obviously, is to avoid just preaching good manners, you know, yes. and, and preaching stuff that somebody could have learned from reading a book on etiquette or something like that. Nobody, nobody comes to church for that. Exactly. Right. Or everything I learn, need to learn. I learned in kindergarten, you know, that book. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you want to know, I was going to say, if you want to know anything about table manners, you can just email me because um, that was something that was very much part of my growing up. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of email for that. Mm-hmm. Now you are about like, to get emails. You know what to do with the fork that's like sideways above the plate, don't you? I do. Right. That, I had to- that's the promise that I'm going to get cheesecake. Or somebody's yeah, getting, somebody's right. getting cheesecake. Somebody's <laughs> getting cheesecake. Anyway. Anyway, uh, anyway we digress. I, the, I words that, to... the words that stick out for me in this one, um, and um, like you recognizing all the things that we've just talked about, but the words that stick out for me are in the, in the um, uh, I, it's the first verse, um, the very first verse, um, and it's the line, they were watching him closely. Um, when I was a kid um, in uh, the church that I was spiritually formed in, we had a woman who joined the choir, um, who eventually I wound up getting a, a babysitting for her, but she had been a former Catholic. And uh, whenever she would come into the church, Um, She was in the choir, but she would come in before the choir processed, and usually there would be like no one in the sanctuary, and she would come in, and from my vantage point, not at that point having had any experience with Catholic, I I thought the first time she walked into the uh, the, the sanctuary, she always tripped, and um, I would watch her, and um, I, being the curious kid that I was, once said to her, why do you always trip when you come into the, the sanctuary? And she first, her first response was, you saw me? And then she said, I used to be a Catholic. And one of the things that I was taught to do was to respect the altar and to bow before the altar whenever we come in. And that's not the practice in this Protestant church. And so I didn't mean to bring attention to myself but it means something to me to acknowledge the altar of God. She took the time to explain it to this kid, but she made a line, she made two lines that I'm sure she didn't, she was just sort of saying it out loud. And that was, you saw me. And two, I didn't mean for anyone to see that. What stuck in my mind not only was the respect for the altar that she had learned, but that it was something that she did out of respect, but she wasn't doing it for show. And the other thing that stuck in my mind was just what I did to her. And that was, there's always somebody watching. And so this text is an opportunity to be able to remind us that When we say we are a follower of Christ, just as they watched Christ, often looking for what they could get him wrong on, 
people are always going to be watching. And the question is, how are we living in such a way that others will know that what we are doing is reflecting the presence and peace and promise of God? Not because we're doing it to show, but we're doing it because we respect God and we want others to do the same. That's what that one little line means. And then, of course, it's a setup for the full text, uh, verses 7 through 14, that is the pericope for this week. Yeah, and um, there is a sense, yeah, this is something we do as a way of honoring God, you know, in private or not making a big deal about it. Um, it's also calling us to a way of living that's not going to help us get ahead in a transactional culture, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is something, too, I think that's that's going on here. Um so people need to know a little bit about the patronage system and what that meant in terms of knowing your place and how you worked your way up that that system in the Roman world. There's plenty of good resources um, for people on that on our website, I'm sure. But um, but to know that what Jesus is asking people to do here is not in their self-interest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at least not in their obvious self-interest, according to the rules that we think are the norms. At the same time, he does say you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, which mm -hmm. I don't know, Joy, you brought up the Catholic Protestant split. That's stuff that we Protestants have a real hard time with. We've, we've taken all the times Jesus talks about reward and we've like either ignored it or just kind of spiritualized it, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. oh, there's a level playing field, but there are plenty of places where Jesus talks about generosity, whether of almsgiving or in this place, dignity and where he says there's a reward at the end of this for you. Mm -hmm. um, which again, it goes against a lot of our <laughs> theological bedrock <laughs> as Protestants. And I recognize where that can lead in terms of a keeping score kind of religion. But at the same time, there is, there is a way where he says God sees and, and God's not going to forget that. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's the motivation that we want to instill in people, but but it's worth noticing that there's there is a kind of oh I don't know a kind of intrinsic or a kind of built-in incentive here, and I would say that reward isn't just like hey you get a better mansion in heaven or something like that, but the reward is also the joy of being in a community that's truly egalitarian or at least that's as mm -hmm. close as we can possibly work at it, or the joy of seeing somebody else get elevated, and you know unless you're horribly cynical you've experienced that in some way anybody who's ever like you know cried or been brought to emotions at a film when somebody else has success or a happy ending is capable of some level of empathy but it's partly that you want to live in that kind of a society where the people around you are elevated too right yeah well, that's, a, that's a reward so. isn't it I think so and I I think the and how I would uh maybe think about that even further is that the, the reward is not only witnessing that, that someone gets elevated, but that that whole means of assessing worth is eliminated. So that, how is that freeing for you as well? that uh, your status is not as being constantly assessed. Why aren't you as high up as you should be? Or why are you where you are? Uh, what, what didn't you do or what did you do to get you, get you to where you are? So those, those hierarchical you know, status uh, levels that we have set up in our society of assessment and worth and value, uh, what would it be for yourself to be freed of that and to sit at sit at a table of that that kind of um, that kind of social equality uh, would be and because I you think about how how much we we don't we don't we don't we don't we not only <laughs> assess that about others but we do that for ourselves and, and the freeing that you're you're describing is that yeah. it frees us because mm -hmm. we're caught in that same you know Absolutely. that same game, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, if we if we eliminate it, 
for the least of these, we eliminate it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's actually good. You know, sometimes we don't think of it that way. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like, oh, well, if we took this hierarchy out, I wouldn't be on top. But is being on top at the expense of someone else being on the bottom, really the life you want to live Mm -hmm. that really the status you want. So I appreciate that, that freeing that, that, that you're talking about Caroline. And um, I, I, I think of this story too, and it sounds in a sense of bragging and I, I, I want to be very careful about it, but I thought about it when you asked Matt, about don't we feel right here and now a sense of that rejoicing when we see someone else lifted up. And uh, I may have talked about this before, but um, um, it was uh, a Sunday afternoon and uh, I was heading uh, to a a church service and there was, I, I was, I was going by a fast food place and there was a homeless guy that was getting food out of the dumpster. And, you know, my thought was, okay, if I'm going to go in and buy this, uh, if I've got money to buy this, I should have money to be able to buy something for someone else. So I bought a meal for him actually more than I wanted. And, and then I just went to him and I asked him, I said, would you like, and he just sort of looked at me like, yeah. yeah." And so I gave it to him and I had bought a, a, a drink and I usually don't get sodas. And I said to him, I said, would you like a drink? And it was really clear that he was completely shocked that what I was giving him was literally the order and not, you know, not, you know, I'll give you this out of my bag, but that this bag, what I bought is actually bought for you. And I felt, I don't mean to brag, but I did feel good because it was clear that that moment was life-giving for him. And I didn't feel good about what I'd done. I felt good because of the joy I saw on his face. Um, so Matt, thank you for calling me to remember that. And I think that's, I think that's a bit of what Jesus is saying here. Um, that man couldn't repay me, and yet he did. Yeah, that I, that's interesting, Joy, because I was just, I was, one of the things that I was thinking about with that last verse that you mentioned, Matt, too, in terms of being repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, is, is the way in which there's a kind of um, ambiguity around what does that actually mean in these last couple of sentences of the pericope, where you have the word repaid, repeated, several times uh, at the end of verse 12 and then uh, and then in verse 14. And so you would uh, that you would be repaid and then as you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, but you will be repaid. So it just calls into question what are your expectations of being repaid by mm-hmm. your your altruistic actions or your giving actions and then what do you, and then what do you expect your repayment and or reward from God? And so it just, it really just called, you know what I mean? It just really calls into a question the way in which we imagine what is repayment? Is it, is it tit for tat, right? Is it, you know, on the same equality level and, and to what extent we expect that uh, on the same, in the same way we have uh, structured, you know, structured our, our kind of a hierarchical, uh, you know, social structure kind of expectations of how we go about living our lives and how is it that repayment happens on those same levels of, of, of a sense of, of um, if I give you this and I want this back. And so I think that's another direction that the sermon could go. Like what, what, what would it mean to be repaid? Like what could they what would they give you back? And what are you expecting from God? Because you did this. Like, yeah, like you said, Matt, another mansion or a bigger mansion. The, I want an ocean view. With a good, I want well, the ocean view. Ocean view. I want the ocean view. I don't want the. I want the ocean view. And I want an infinity pool. That's what I want. So yeah. a friend of mine, when we were in the choir, used to talk about how, um, um, people that uh, she disagreed with, she would say, you know, I, I know you're going to be in heaven and I know you got a mansion, but, but with your attitude, your mansion is going to be so far on the other side of heaven. It's going to take you all day to walk to choir rehearsal. 
<laughs> so my mansion needs to be closer to quarry like there that. you go I like that. <laughs> um the the, the uh, over the last couple of weeks we've kind of talked about looking ahead and kind of anticipating where we're going. And if you've been doing a uh, loop and addressing this question of disrupting the systems of bringing justice in um, a place where people have hungered and thirst and needing liberation, um, this, uh, um, I think the text last week was uh, something to the effect of shaking heaven and earth. Um, this, this particular text, is shaking, as you uh, spoke of earlier, Matt, it's shaking the very patronist system of the culture. And it is saying, this is our practice. This is the way we do things. This is what is right. And yet it is not right in the sight of God because what it is doing to others, what it is doing to our neighbors. And so this fits in that same pattern week after week as we've done these verses in, in, um, in Luke in terms of when will we actually see the justice of God uh, for, for everyone. Um, and I'm, I'm leaning into your title um, from a couple of weeks ago, Caroline, uh, if not, well, if not today, when. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the Proverbs obviously very, very quickly uh, gives us a one-liner to go back to the ancient wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. Don't do not put forward uh, yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here than to be put low, uh, put lower in the presence of a noble. And one of the things that just that verse um, standing out there reminds uh, me to say to our listeners is to remember that the teachings of Jesus are the teachings he was raised on. Mm -hmm. This is the ancient wisdom of the people of God, Israel. This is what he would have been taught. And Matt, you said, I think it was you that asked us uh, a couple of weeks ago or, or reminded us a couple of weeks ago that God has always been doing this. God has always been calling for a people to do this. So this proverb tells us that what Jesus is calling for in the first century is not, hey, God, now that I'm on earth, I've got this great idea yeah. for what we should do with the people. Yeah. No, Jesus is simply doing what God has always been asking God's people to do. Jesus wasn't making stuff up. Yes. Yeah, I mean, Christians get all their best ideas from Judaism. We get all of our best theological ideas from Judaism. I mean, that's just yeah. to help people recognize that. Sorry, Caroline, okay. I cut you off. No, no, no. I, I was going to, uh, with, you know, it's obvious why the Proverbs uh, passage is, is picked. And, uh, and the commentary on the website the notices that the lectionary rarely encounters the book of Proverbs. And, uh, and here we only have two verses. So, you know, how do you preach a whole sermon on two verses? But... And then she has this great quote uh, in the uh, uh, Ellen Davis quote about, you know, the uh, grain of spice and the brevity of the Proverbs, you can, so, something you can carry with you. So that's what I would do with the Proverbs first. Like if you're going to preach on, if you're going to preach on Luke and then use the Proverbs verse, what if you, what if you said to people, okay, this week, uh, this is your memory verse for the week. Okay. Go back to remember when you had to memorize verses this is your memory verse and uh that you carry it around with you the whole week and how does that change your perspective in everything that you do even when you don't realize that there are systems in place that are about you know that are about hierarchy or who gets to go first or who chooses the greater seat or whatever um the way in which it so much permeates our society and so uh, that's what I would do with this verse. I'm like, or, or like, every, or put it on a post-it note or something and like have people every day wake up and, and say it and where they can read it every day, maybe not memorize it and have that have so that their perspective is the wisdom as we were talking about their perspective for the week, the way they move about in the world for the week is the wisdom of ancient Israel and the wisdom that Jesus is now embodying in this story. That's what I would do with Proverbs. 
<laughs> Can we also, I'm going to do something crazy and we'll go straight to the Psalm. I mean, I just would say, oh yeah. Oh, we're talking Good about idea. this too. I mean, the Psalm talks about, about the, not the prosperity or the wellness or that maybe even the happiness of people who are generous and mm-hmm. just to remind people that general <laughs> people like being generous or these generous people are fun to be around. They tend to be happy people. Mm-hmm. Not just because they pick up my tab, but they just, they're honestly, <laughs> they're good folks usually. Mm-hmm. And that it's a spiritual act. And that sometimes the way to generosity is to force yourself into doing it. I mean, I think the Psalm in some ways mm-hmm. celebrates that. So it's less mm-hmm. of, a, of an obligation and burden and more of a way in which we might just be hardwired, right? To, mm-hmm. to think about the, the well being of others. And we've talked about this. This is not just altruism. No. I'm not even sure pure altruism is possible, right? Because mm-hmm. it's we get we, we get something back, whether it's the dopamine rush, you know, of a kind of act or just mm-hmm. the way your outlook changes or personality changes. Which again, I don't want to preach um etiquette. Right. right. But to yeah. talk about how this ties us into a God who is the um the paradigm of generosity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if yeah. if if I uh if if I don't know if you want to say something uh, there about the psalm. I was going to go back to Jeremiah. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's great that's about the psalm. Okay, yep. yeah, do it. I'm, that's all I have to say. I love I it. To say. I, yeah, I love that's, it. That's and, great. And, and, and that leads to, for me, it leads to what I was thinking about in terms of, of Jeremiah. Um, when you when you talk, you said uh, it's not about, you, you, you're cautioning us again about not teaching etiquette, but we are embracing an ethic that is the ethic of God. It has always been the intention of God to offer grace, mercy, justice, righteousness, uh, to care for what we call the least. And Jeremiah, this pericope sets up why we have this inequitable system, that the very people who handle the law do not know God that God has brought God's people into plenty, into a prosperous place, into the place of promise. And God's people set up a culture that did not extend that to the neighbor, to everyone. And so um, I appreciate, Matt, that you brought us back to Jeremiah going through the psalm in the way that you did, because I think it gives us a different platform for looking at Jeremiah um, that that I think is worth considering or uh, one that I, I would like to see somebody, um, uh, you know, delve into. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I like, I really like that. And also, like, I would direct people to the end of the commentary if they want to do Jeremiah. I Jeremiah. really, really appreciated those questions mm-hmm. and that relate to the what, the theme that we've already talked about. How has God blessed us in the past? How is God still blessing us? How and why do we overlook the blessings? Uh, what can cause us to look elsewhere, uh, right? And um, how do we develop a relationship with God that will keep us focused on our commitment to God? So uh, I... I, um, I, I think one thing that you said, Joy, is, is, and actually, Matt, you were saying this too, is that this is not altruism. This is like, it's actually embodying God's generosity. Um, My mother, I was reminded of this several weeks ago, my, um, my sister, uh, my sister put flowers on the grave of my mother for Memorial Day. Um, so this was a, in a couple of months ago now, uh, but it's just kind of stuck with me. And so she took a photo of it and sent it to me. And so it has my mom's headstone and my mom on her headstone, we had blessed to be a blessing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's just how she, you know, how she lived. And I think that's part of what we're talking about here. It's like, that's, it's this, um, and I, to think about that, you're actually, you know, and you're actually doing the ethics of God or embodying the generosity of God, that, that you're not just doing nice things for people, uh, mm-hmm. but you're, you're actually, yeah, that's puts it at a whole different level. Mm-hmm. And that's what the Hebrews text is, isn't it? 
let mutual love continue. Yeah, right. No, uh, yeah. It, it's the embodiment of the very practices of God, the very heart of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, um, I, I want to lift this up uh, just because uh, prison ministry matters to me. Um, um, showing hospitality to strangers, we sort of made some allusions to that. Um, everybody kind of likes to take this time to say, you know, what angel have you entertained that you didn't anticipate? But um, this this first three, uh, remember those who are in prison. Prison back in that in ancient times was not like prison today. Um, prison today, um, as bad as it is, and I want to be very clear, uh, the institution, the uh, institution, uh, the, the indu- industrialized prison complex is a bad institution. Um, but for some people in their most destitute moments, whether it's a warring gang that's going after them or just on their last dime, prison means three hots and a cop. It means three meals and a bed. And that was not the case in the ancient days. So when Jesus is saying, remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison yourself, Jesus is saying, this is a place where nobody's visiting you. You're not getting food. You're not resting. You're not safe. This is not a warm place. This is not a cozy place. Nobody's making money off of this. And so this whole idea of remembering those in prison is a much stronger um, um, uh, invitation or challenge to us than simply writing a letter, being a pen pal to someone that's in prison. Sorry, I got off on my little soapbox. (laughs) It raises that question of community, right? Which is, Mm -hmm. you know, what part of what's going on with, with whom are you associated and who is this church community? I mean, we've other places, it talks in Hebrews about meeting together and which is, you know, churches are still figuring this out post COVID, but also like, who is, who is the church's context uh, and, and network. So to spend some time with that, to talk about the reliability of Jesus in the midst of changing community and those who, who, um, suffer ancient prison conditions or even, you know, um, like you said, joy in today's industrial complex, um, that Christ remains consistent. And so that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't think that means that Jesus is immutable or that Jesus doesn't change. I think it means that Jesus is always dependable, um, that dependability is always consistent and available as, as well. And to think about what that looks like as our own sense of community change changes as our own sense of, of wellness or being taken care of might be high or low at a certain time and how the church is always the mediator of that certain dependability in any kind of season. And that's where I would call people's attention to the last paragraph of the, of the commentary, because it, uh, it, it's, yeah, what you're saying, Matt, is really what that, what is a congregation's vitality, um, especially as preachers have had to revisit what that vitality means in the last couple of years uh, but it's that vitality is is de- is demonstrable demonstrated in deep love radical hospitality solidarity uh, and that is uh, that's those are the measures of a Christian community.